uh, I guess before I go back into this, uh, the important thing this week is that we're doing problem sets in lab. Um, so at your, um, so when you come to your lab, uh, I'm gonna give the lab, you know, 15 minutes or so to get started, um, answer questions and stuff, get everyone set up, and then one by one, I'm gonna bring you back into that back room. You're just gonna explain, like, step me through how you did the problem set. Um, so that, for one, I know that you're understanding how to do it, and uh, two, so that I can make corrections like on the fly, you know, I think it's a little more useful than handing something back with, you know, marks on it that are hard to understand and whatever. So, um, if you forgot to do the problem set, uh, you know, we can work around that, uh, especially the first, you know, the first week. Um, so just let me know and, uh, a lot of times, we, um, I think most of the time, we don't get through all the problem sets in one week anyways, so some people will have to do theirs next week. So, um, so just let me know if you're not done. Uh, all right. Um, so last time we talked about introduced Newton's third law. Third law. Um, and I'm going to abbreviate that N3L. And in words, Newton's third law says um, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, for our purposes, though, to think about it mathematically, you can just think of it as, so our definition of Newton's third law is just that a force on A by B is equal to negative force vector on B by A, okay? Um, Now, uh, remember, when you draw free body diagrams, there are two possible types of forces that you deal with. Forces where you know the direction and forces where you don't know the direction. If you don't know the direction, you're using this subscript notation, so this is the easier way to, to use Newton's third law. If you do know the direction, um, So if the force direction is known, Newton's third law has the effect of um, keeping the force magnitude the same and switching the direction um, when you go to the free body diagram of the other body. Okay, so when you're switching between these two bodies that are applying forces to each other. Um, so these are the two ways that we're going to use Newton's third law, and um, I'm going to try to just be real, you know, take a lot of time to point out when we're using Newton's third law, when we're using one way of thinking about it, when we're using the other, how they're equivalent, because this is a complicated idea and it's going to take a while for this to kind of ingrain itself. Um, so I brought up... Um, one thing last time, uh, how is it that, um, 
so this is always kind of a confusing thing about Newton's third law. And I remember uh, like talking to a friend of mine who was, you know, when I was taking physics for the first time in high school, like I said, yeah, like Newton's third law means, you know, any two things when they hit each other, they apply the same magnitude of force to each other. And, and he's like, well, you know, what about this? Like, and ba basically it's a similar example to the bat hitting the baseball and the baseball goes flying. And, it, and he just sort of was like, well, that just, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you're thinking about it wrong. And, you know, I, I was new to it. So I was like, yeah, I'm probably just thinking about it wrong. But, but that really is what Newton's third law says. When these two, when two objects collide or interact in any way, any force that one applies to the other one, the other one applies to the first one um, in, in the opposite direction. Uh, so what do you think about the, about the baseball thing? Like, did, I know most of you spent a few hours at least this weekend in a quiet setting thinking about this baseball example, drawing diagrams and computer models and like anybody have any thoughts on like how how do you how can that make any sense that the baseball applies the same force to the bat that the bat applies to the baseball but the bat almost its motion is exactly the same as it was before and the baseball flies 500 feet uh-huh it's the same thing yeah same force So um, one way to think about it, uh, maybe, yep. So I would guess if you were to alter the bat to have the same mass as well, you would heat them together? Yes. They would bounce off each other, right? Yes. Okay. That's, that's exactly uh, the situation. So, um, so I just tried to spell how with a W. So how can... A bat and a ball apply the same magnitude of force to each other but the bat keeps swinging And the ball entirely reverses its direction and flies 500 feet. Um, and the answer is that the bat has some major advantages um, over the ball when they're in this collision. Like, which one of them, if you think of like winning a collision is basically not accelerating very much, losing a co collision is accelerating a lot, you know, like a, um, like a bicycle and a semi truck, you know. Um, so here is what the bat has going for it that the ball doesn't, okay? So first, the bat has much more mass. Than the ball, OK? Second, the bat is connected to a person who has much more mass than the bat. And third, uh, that person, so now, like, this sort of gives you a sense of the, how unfair this was as a battle, you know? Like, the ball's this little thing. It's having a collision with a system of a bat and a person that together weigh 200 pounds or whatever. 
And then in addition to that, the, bat is, the ball is flying through the air and the person's feet are touching the ground, you know? So friction's holding the person solidly in place. So the player's feet are rooted to the ground. And all of these three things contribute to the, the result that is you don't see acceleration of the bat and you do see acceleration of the ball. Um, so these all keep the bat from accelerating backwards. Um, and so this is, I think, examples of this type um, are going to take a little while for, you know, you're going to have to think about Newton's third law for a little while before these don't occur to you as something that's wrong with Newton's third law. Like the fact is it just isn't something that's wrong with Newton's third law. It's just your intuition is a little wrong about that for most people, you know. Um, but here's a case where, like, here's an example, sort of a similar example, but I think it, um, it kind of points out to you that, that in a sense you do kind of have a feeling about Newton's third law from your, from your everyday experience. Um, so imagine uh, you're at a barbecue and you're like, why didn't we have this barbecue before it was 30 degrees outside? But okay, no, imagine it was like two weeks ago and it was nice outside and you were barbecuing. Um, and uh, some kids are playing soccer and the soccer ball rolls over to you, okay? And you're barefoot. And the kid says, hey, send the soccer ball back. So imagine that you're, um, imagine that you're 15 feet away, okay? Like from here to there, basically. Um, then you don't think twice about it, right? You just nudge the ball back, no problem, right? But what if the ball rolls over and this faraway voice yells like, hey, kick the soccer ball back, and you look and the kid's like 50 yards away. So like think about that. And feel, like think about the smells of the barbecue. Um, but like what goes through your head is like, I don't know if I really want to kick this ball like as hard as I can in bare feet, right? And the reason is because it hurts. And the reason it hurts is for you to kick a ball 50 yards, you have to apply a big force to the ball, you know? And if you apply a big force to the ball, you know from experience that that ball is gonna apply a large force to your foot and, and it's gonna sting, you know? You're gonna feel that slap. And so, um, anyways, Try not to get hung up on things that uh, that seem wrong about Newton's third law. And when you get turned around backwards, think about that. Think about that soccer example. I think that's I think that's a nice like sort of illustration of of how it works. You know, to apply a force, big force to the ball, it means the ball has to apply a big force to you, and and you know that experience. Remember that kicker for the Denver Broncos for a long time who kicked barefoot? That's crazy. Um, that guy did not understand Newton's third law. Um, oh, also, I want to draw this picture. I draw this picture every class because I just thought it was so funny at the time, and it's still kind of funny. Um, so when I took physics for the first time in high school, uh, Mike Tyson was like an up and coming young fighter. Like everyone was afraid of him, but he hadn't won the heavyweight championship yet. But everybody was like, oh my God, no one's going to ever beat this guy. And um, my, uh, like he was just going through people, like he'd just walk, you know, the bell would ring. He'd just walk over and hit, hit them once and the fight would be over. And it was like fight after fight after fight was that way. It was really like, alarming and 
our, uh, um, our physics teacher was this like very out of shape 60 year old guy, you know, and, and he was like, I wish they'd give me a chance to fight Mike Tyson. If they gave me a shot, I guarantee I could hit him as hard as he hit me. And he drew this picture. <laughs> With, so this is Mike Tyson's arm. And this is my teacher's face. And uh, so the idea is um, Newton's third law says, and this is, it's not like a misinterpretation or anything. Um, if you drew a free body diagram of the arm, Okay, so there's the arm. At some point, you'd have to close the outline, so, you know. And you'd have the weight, and you'd have some other forces, right? But over here, you'd have a force vector um, the force on the glove by the face, right? because you look around the boundary for places that outside objects are touching. Here's one, and so that's labeled force on the glove by the face. And over here in your free body diagram of the face, <laughs> um, you'd have the weight, you'd have the force on the head by the neck, and we don't care about those right now. And then you'd have a force vector on the face by the glove. And this is exactly the right way to interpret Newton's third law. It says that the magnitude of this force, the size of this force on the face by the glove is equal to the size of the force on the glove by the face. So Mike Tyson produced the you know, the biggest forces that anyone could produce. Okay, I don't know how much it was, but let's say 10,000, I don't know, it's probably a lot more than that. Let's say 50,000 Newtons of force um, that, that his glove applied to people's face. That also means that his glove felt bigger forces than any boxer's glove had ever felt before, you know? The thing that makes this, and, and so that's totally, that's the right way to think about it. That's totally true. The thing that makes this funny is like, it would not be a good strategy to, you know, try to go into a boxing match and assault someone's glove with your face, you know? Um, let me also, uh, Let me draw the same thing, but let's say that we knew the force direction that the glove was going to apply to the face. Because we basically do, right? I mean, it's basically um, going towards this person's left over to the right of the screen, right? There might be some component up or down, but it's basically going to the right. Yes? Um, this isn't necessarily a problem when we're talking about gravity, uh, but I was asking for uh, one of the definitions of force. Uh huh. Because I think that's the definition Yeah, I mean, um, you can think of it. Okay, so there are kind of two answers, I think. The first one is. Um, the first one is 
sort of the intuitive answer and it, there's no way to connect any numbers to it at all. But it's like an intensity of pushing or pulling, okay? How hard is something being pushed on or pulled on, okay? Um, but there's no numbers attached to that. The only way to apply numbers to it is to use, think of Newton's second law as a definition of the force, okay? So you could, so you say like, if you have an object that doesn't have any other forces on it, okay, or um, you could think of like a hockey puck on, on ice, then horizontally at least it, it doesn't have any major forces because there's not much friction, okay? And then you could think of um, <coughs> the definition of the force that the hockey stick applies to it is um, you measure the acceleration, uh, multiply by the hockey puck's mass, and that gives you the magnitude of the force. So there's sort of a mathematical definition and a just sort of rough, like, what's a force? It's how hard something's being pushed on or pulled on. So force only applies when friction. Um, well, uh, that's sort of an open question with, but the way we're thinking about it, there's one count, there's one uh, thing that doesn't fit that description, and that's gravity. Um, people are still looking for particles that show that gravity is actually contact in some way, but um, but for us, we'd just think about it as like a remote force that somehow acts over a distance. But every other force we deal with, is, they have to be in contact, yeah. Okay, so let's say that we knew the force direction. Uh, let's say on the face by the glove. So what would that free body diagram? Yeah. So what would that free body diagram look like? Well, it's still the same outline. And you still have the weight, and you still have some unknown force applied by the neck. But now over here, we could treat this. Say we know that the force is in this direction. We just don't know what the magnitude is. So I'll give it the variable name F because that subscript notation only works for vectors. Okay? I said that last time, I think. Um, so no subscript notation when your variables are scalars. And then when you go to the free body diagram of the arm, It's, let me just make it a little more clear, I guess, that um, then you still have the force with the same magnitude F. The only thing that changes is that arrow goes in the opposite direction. What? Okay, because... Um, when you um, when you indicate the direction, so it's kind of a <coughs> it's kind of a hard thing to explain. Like the force itself is always a vector, okay? But the question is, what's the variable that you're using to describe the force? Okay, right. So we all the arrow gives the direction, and that means that's all that's left for the variable to describe is the magnitude. Um, okay, so I'm going to do an example that shows uh, sort of a common use of this, uh, of Newton's third law, and that's in doing problems where you have a bunch of bodies touching. 
um, a bunch of bodies in contact. Um, so let's say that there are three carts. rolling along a flat surface. Uh, the first one's one kilogram, the second one's two kilograms, third one's three kilograms, and there's a 25 Newton force acting on the, one, on the leftmost cart pushing towards the right, okay? And the coordinate system I'm going to use has the x-axis horizontal and the y-axis vertical. And we're going to calculate two things. The acceleration vector of the system. And second, we're going to calculate the force vector on the two kilogram cart by the three kilogram cart. Um, well, I guess for the first part, we don't have to think about the contact forces between the object. And uh, in general, this is the approach you pretty much always want to take. It works. It's the best way to go so often that you might as well just always do it in any, in any problem uh, where you have a bunch of objects in contact. First, isolate all of them together and see what you can figure out, okay? That usually is the way to calculate the acceleration, okay? So let's isolate the whole system. So all three together. So the free body diagram looks like something like that. Uh, that's, the, that's the outline, the closed outline. Um, so the forces acting are the weight and then any places where there's contact with the outside world at the boundary. So the weight, um, this, our system has a mass of six kilograms. So 6 times 9.81 is 58.86 newtons acting down. And now we're looking for contact at the boundary. Where are their forces acting at the boundary? There are two places. Yeah, whatever this thing is, that's on the boundary. And then the wheels, yep. So um, this is a pushing contact between the ground and the wheels along a flat surface. So what do we know about the direction of that force? Yeah, that's right. We know that, it's, that the force is going to be perpendicular to the flat surface, so perpendicular to the ground, and we know it's going to be towards the chosen body, away from the contacting body, and that gives us, tells us it's up instead of down. Okay, so I'm just putting it on these wheels. You know, it's really spread out among all the wheels. I'm just putting it over here to make the picture easier to read. Um, and you can call that whatever you want. I'm going to call it N for normal. That's what people call it most often. <coughs> Anything else? Nope, that's it. So now Newton's second law. Um, the 25 Newton force is 25, 0. Anyone have any questions about coming up with those components? Uh, the weight force is 0, negative 58.86. And then what are the components of the normal force? Zero, positive n. Yep, it's pointing in the positive y direction. The other way, remember, you can think about that is think about putting the tail at the origin 
calculating the angle from the positive x-axis, that would be 90 in this case. And so you have n times cosine of 90, n times sine of 90, and so you get 0n that way too. And so that's all the forces. Over here we have the mass of 6 times, um, times the acceleration vector. Do we know anything about the acceleration? Yep, we know it's going to be horizontal, so I'm just going to write that as A0. And so we have two equations from this. 25 is equal to 6A. And that says that A is equal to 4.167 meters per second squared. And the second equation says negative uh, 58.86 plus N is equal to zero. Uh, we weren't asked for N, but it's you could solve for that normal force and you get 58.86 newtons. Okay, so if we're trying to calculate the acceleration vector, how do we get it now that we calculated? We calculated a variable, but we're trying to get an acceleration vector. So how do we go from one to the other one? That's right. This is our acceleration vector. And so take this variable, plug it back into the vector, and we get that the acceleration vector is 4.167 meters per second squared, zero. Any questions about that? Yep. So we solved for n, but couldn't we just look at the definition of the potential mass and say it just turned out to be that that's a good question. A lot of times it works like that, but I wanna I wanna show you, make it clear why that's not quite Newton's third law. Okay. Um so this force if we write this in the subscript notation, this is the force um, on the, let's say, on the system by gravity. Okay? This force is the force on the system. Well, gravity and ground have the same first letters, stupid words. Okay, so this is on the system, all right, on the system by gravity. And this one is on the system by the ground, okay? And Newton's third law doesn't say anything about what happens when you change subscripts to other subscripts. All it says is if you switch the order of the same two subscripts, uh, then you have the, that equal and opposite thing, okay? Are there situations where the, force the normal force is not equal to the weight? Yeah, yeah and actually, um, remember when we first started talking about um, first started talking about Newton's second law? I gave a couple examples that that didn't work that way. Um, the man on the elevator on the on the scale, and remember the the force that the scale applies to the man is not equal to his weight if the elevator is accelerating. And so that's always the issue. If there's, if there's any acceleration, then the normal force is not equal to the weight. Also, um, if, the, if the ground is angled at all, if it's not, if it's not horizontal, then you also, those aren't the same. Oh yeah, that's um that's just six kilograms times nine point eight one meters per second squared. Mm -hmm. 
or if the direction is changing. So if the velocity is changing in any way. Yes. Okay, so we got the acceleration. Um, and now we want to figure out the force on car two by car three. Uh, so we're going to have to choose something else to isolate. Why, why are we going to have to choose a different body to isolate in order to calculate that force? Well, that force doesn't even show up in this free body diagram because it's, it's internal to that boundary. So what we need to do is isolate a body where that force is on the boundary, okay? So that gives us a few options. I mean, we could isolate car one and car two together. We could isolate car three by itself. We could isolate car two by itself. But somehow or other, we have to have, you know, the boundary of our outline be the boundary between car two and car three. So um, let's do a free body diagram of, well, what are we looking for? The force on two by three. Let's uh, isolate um, Let's do three. Okay, um, so the weight is acting on this. Uh, so three kilograms is the chosen body times 9.81, so 29.43 uh, newtons acting down. And now go around, around the boundary and look for places where there's contact at the boundary. What? The wheels, yep. So that is... Now remember that contact force between the wheels and the carts before were all the contact for all three of those carts. This is just for one of them, so it's not going to be the same thing. I'll call that N3. Okay, but it's in this direction for the same reason. It's a pushing contact uh, along a flat surface. Uh, anywhere else? Yes. Uh, and do we know the direction of that force? Yep, that's also a contact along a flat surface. So it's going to go this way. And I'll call that F. You could, you know, it does the letter doesn't matter, but we know the direction, so that variable has to be a scalar. All right. Um, so here is, here is something that is really easy to get wrong, and it's easy to talk yourself backwards on it. Like, we know that this whole system is moving. We just calculated it, its acceleration, right? And we know that the system wouldn't move without that 25 Newton force. Right? So that 25 Newton force has to appear here somehow, right? That's obvious, right? But the fact is that it doesn't appear, okay? You have to just be like careful, disciplined about just going around the boundary and looking for contact. That 25 Newton force isn't applied to this boundary, so it doesn't appear here. It does influence the motion of this cart, but it influences it through this contact force F that's here, okay? So that's, that's going to be a tricky thing to get used to, but there's no 25 Newton force there. Uh, so Newton's second law says F0 plus 0, negative 29.43 plus 0 N3 is equal to the mass 3 times the acceleration vector of this cart. Do we know that? Yeah, because that's the same as the system. They're all moving the same way. So 
Um, now, we're looking for the force vector on 2 by 3, right? What, using subscript notation, what would be the name of this force vector? The force on what by what? That's right. This is F3, 2, okay? So that's not exactly what we're looking for, but Newton's third law says F2, 3 is negative F3, 2. So it's just as good for us to calculate this and then use Newton's third law, okay? <coughs> so the first equation says the variable F is equal to 3 times 4.167. So 12.5 newtons. And so the force vector on 3 by 2 is equal to, plug this variable back into the vector that's in Newton's second law, and you get 12.50. Um, Newton's third law then says F23 is equal to negative F32, which is negative 12.50. Zero. So the direction um, of the force applied to body two by body three, which direction does that point? Yep, it points to the left, um, which is opposite of this. And so even though in this case, I use Newton's third law with that um, by switching the subscripts and switching the signs. It means the exact same thing as switching the arrow directions and keeping the same variable. Okay. Um, I want to do one more. I want to solve this a different way. Okay. And um, show that we get the same thing. Because it's, so, it's sort of interesting. At first, it's, I think, I remember it seeming sort of like magic or what, like, how can, how do you end up getting the same thing uh, doing the calculation where you isolate body three as you do doing the calculation where you isolate body one and then use that to isolate body two. And this time you had the 25 Newtons in there and all this stuff, but you do get the same thing. Um, so now I'll do um, part B over by isolating, um, I guess I'll do two and three together. Uh, no, sorry, one and two together. So we'll get the same thing. So free body diagram of the one kilogram and the two kilogram cart. There's a weight. Uh, the total mass is three kilograms. Um, so this one is 29.43. And then where is their contact with the boundary? The wheels, yep. So I'll call that N23. Yes.
And then the 25 is acting on the boundary, so that goes here. Okay. Oh, right. <laughs> That's, yeah, we need that. In, and then there's contact over on this side, too. That's what we're trying to solve for. So um, we know it's going to push this way. I'll just give it the variable name r or something. Um, so this is the force vector we're trying to figure out. And we're going to figure it out as a vector by solving for this variable and then plug it in. Uh, so Newton's second law says twenty-five zero plus zero negative twenty-nine point four three plus zero n one two plus uh, this. R force, what's that in components? Negative R0. Um, so it's pointing in the negative x direction. The other way you could do it, like you always can with vector components, is think of putting its tail at the origin. That would be 180 degrees. Then you'd have R times cosine of 180, R times sine of 180. And either way, you end up with negative R0. And that's equal to the mass, 3, times the acceleration, 4.1670. Um, so the first equation says 25 minus r is equal to positive 12.50 and so r is equal to 12.50 um, if you plug that value back into this vector this is the force on 2 by 3 Okay, so 12.5, plug it in here, and you get the force on 2 by 3 is equal to negative 12.50, 0. And that's the same thing that we got going from the other side. Any questions about that? How did I get this? Because, so there's two ways to think about it. One is to notice that this arrow is pointing in the negative x direction. And so you're just going to have a negative r for your x component. The other way is to put the tail of this vector at the origin of the coordinate system, figure out the angle from the positive x axis, which is 180 in this case, and, and go through cosine and sine. Um, Anybody have, well, any other questions? Anyone know why? So there's one thing that you couldn't do. So I isolated three, and that worked. I isolated one and two together, and that worked. Why didn't I isolate just two by itself? Anyone have a feel for what would go wrong there? Yep. Yes, that's exactly right. So if you, um, you couldn't. have just isolated the 2 kilogram because um, you'd have the weight force. Uh, this would be 19.62. You'd have a force at the wheels, N2. You'd have a force going this way, the one that you're trying to calculate. But then you'd also have this force going this way, you know, call that R2. Um, this is what we want. 
but we can't solve for it because that's another horizontal variable. And so, um, here's a best guess approach. There's no approach that always works for every problem, but this works, this is the best way to go in general when you see a problem with uh, multiple objects in contact. Objectus, objects in contact. Um, so first, isolate the whole structure. And see what that lets you find. The most common thing that it'll let you find is the acceleration. And second, um, isolate objects from the outside in. Um, so you can isolate things that are on the edges of the system but you can't usually isolate things that are in the middle because they have too many forces to solve for them. Yep? So on that one, let's say if you had uh, the same mass on both sides. Yeah. You just truck them all and you add yourself. So you couldn't um, isolate two angles. Uh-huh. So what if we had the force from three and the mass yeah. from three and one the same? Yeah, I would, I would say don't do that. I mean, there are some cases where that idea does work, but I would say just get in the habit of doing it always the same way. You know, I think that, that would just end up causing more trouble than it would help. But you're right, sometimes stuff like that works. Um, any other questions? Okay, um, I'm going to do another one. This might be the last thing we get to in this class, but um, next class uh, we'll do some problems that you'll work on, and hopefully that'll kind of help with this stuff. Um, okay, so another example. So let's say that we have a flat ground again. And let's say we have a 20 kilogram box, a 10 kilogram box, and a 30 kilogram box. And let's say that these two are connected by a cable. Thirty. And let's say that this system is being pushed to the left by a 200 Newton force like that. Um, And let's say we want to calculate uh, the force 
on the 20 by the 10, and the force on the 10 by the 20. So the approach is, first we're going to isolate the whole thing. Oh, and uh, say this contact is frictionless. So the free body diagram of the whole system. Okay, so there's the whole system. Um, there is a weight. Uh, so the total is 60 kilograms. Um, so the weight is going to be 588.6 acting down. And now we're looking for contact at the boundary. Um, there's a force up from the ground, call that N. And where else is there a force at the boundary? Yep, the 200 Newton force this way. Um, just to make it more readable, I'm going to say it's like this. So Newton's second law says, uh, what's the force vector that this 200 Newton force is applying? Negative 200, zero. It's in the negative x direction. Uh, plus zero, negative 588.6 plus zero n is equal to the total mass, 60, times A, 0, because we know it's going to stay along that surface. And so from the second equation, we know N is equal to 588.6. And from the first equation, we know that negative 200 is equal to 60A. So A is equal to uh, negative 3.33. Three. So if the if the variable A is negative 3.33, what's the acceleration vector? Yep, so we're going to take this variable, plug it back into this vector. Again, that's what you always do. The acceleration vector is negative 3.33 meters per second squared, zero. And now we can isolate one of those other two members. Um, well, in this case, like, outside in doesn't give you a ton of information, right? Um, if you, it turns out if you tried isolating um, the, how big is that one over there, 20? If you tried isolating the 20 kilogram object, you wouldn't be able to do it, even though it's on the outside position-wise, you know? And the reason is it just has two unknown forces acting on it. So instead, in this case, we're going to isolate the 10-kilogram box. And this one, uh, we have... The weight, 
98.1. We have a force of 200. That's that external force. And we have a pushing contact along a flat surface over here. So I'll just call that F. And so Newton's second law says F0 plus negative 200, 0. Oh, and I forgot the normal force. And 10. Plus 0, negative 98.1 plus 0 n10 is equal to 10 times the acceleration vector the vector that we're looking for is this one this f0 is the force on the 10 by the 20 so if we can figure out what this variable f is, then we know we can plug that in and get that vector. <coughs> um, so the first equation says f minus 200 is equal to negative 33.33. So f is equal to positive 166.67. So the force on the 10 by the 20 is equal to positive 166.670. So that force is in the direction shown by that arrow. It's to the right. Now, if we want to figure out the force vector on the 20 by the 10, Newton's third law says the force on the 20 by the 10 is the opposite of this, so negative 166.670. What direction does that point? It points to the left, the negative x direction, and... Um, if you think about the original problem, you know, if, the, if this 10 kilogram box is pushing on this 20 kilogram box, the force on the 20 kilogram box has to be, you know, toward the chosen body, away from the contacting body. So that makes sense. Any questions about that? Right. So if you isolated the um, the 30 kilogram, you have the weight, 294.3. You have a normal force. N30. And then the only other place where there's contact is at this cable. So there's a tension force there. And you could use that to calculate this tension force. You just that wouldn't have gotten you any closer to calculating F2, you know, F1020 or F2010. Well, you, we already got the acceleration from isolating the whole thing, so you'd still use that same acceleration, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's stop there.